Hawaii. So finally, I am back on track with my X study. I'm sorry for the long pause. I was on vacation and then we got back and I went straight back to work and all this stuff and the la di da di da and then was busy the past couple of weekends. So I'm back to it. And I have to be honest that I'm having still a hard time with acts and it's hard for me to get through. So even though I've read the scripture um, before and I know of these stories, I can't get through them as I read them very easily with clear understanding. And I think it's because of two things that I know I need to look at the timeline and when these things took place differently, but I also feel like lately things have just been more glitchy in the matrix for me. And I don't say that tongue in cheek. I mean like the more I feel something isn't right in the world, and the more you know, the more you see how it truly is a matrix. Like where are we really? And uh, physically and um, in time, if time is even a thing. And I'm not trying to get all hyper weird. It's just things aren't always lining up like they used to, but I guess the cognitive dissonance uh, does that to you when it breaks. Um, so anyways... Uh, sorry for the fan noise in the background. It's humid here in Chicago, and it's dreary. It's 66 out, but the humidity makes it feel like it's 75. So, um, I, I, I'm not a fan of the humidity, so I have to keep the cool air going. So if you hear that in the background, sorry. If you don't, great. Um, so, so many things are rattling around in my head that I don't even know if I'm going to remember it to make videos about. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Um, so maybe the Holy Spirit is just trying to teach me things. He did teach me a lot this past week. It was a hard week. Um, but at the same time, like I said, this matrix thing is kind of getting to me. I really don't know what to do with it. Because the more we look at it, the more I see just things are not as it seems. And there's so much fake out there, you don't even see uh, the truth until you really have to, you have to intentionally wake up. Because it's so easy to get lulled back to sleep. Because everyone around you is. So, um, anyways, uh, I just don't find myself talking to many people anymore, except maybe at work for just work things. Um, I've stopped going to church for multiple reasons. Uh, I stopped going at first because you know, the shutdowns and blah, 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 and they were acquiescing, and I did not like that, and my pastor seemed to be behind all that stuff, but as Yah moved me forward, I started studying and hearing about the Sabbath being on Saturday, and the Torah law being a, um, an everlasting covenant and an everlasting law, and so I'm studying more on that, and that's part of the matrix, too, we're so steeped, I mean we as Christ followers are so steeped in these traditions of the church, even though uh, non-denominational churches and the like will say we are separate from the Catholic Church. I don't see it as that anymore. I see it as they are just as much engrossed in the traditions of the world, and they're not that different. Uh, not that I want to be different just so everyone will look at me. I don't want that. I just want to do what's right in the scripture and what Yah the Most High really does want me to do as 
about his child. So anyways, that's why I've started, I started leaving the church for that reason, the Saturday Sabbath. And then I did go a couple times, um, and uh, I couldn't even just stand uh, them talking about the culture or just uh, talking about the timeline, about the thousands and thousands of years. And um, I don't blame them. They don't understand. But at the same time, if... I were to stay there, it would truly be faking it. Um, and then if I did voice my concerns or voice my um, studies or my inquiries or my uh, beliefs at this time, they completely would dismiss it, completely not understand. Um, I don't really know why I'm telling you all this, so I'm just telling you where I've been. So it's come to the point now, I guess I want to say, uh, this weekend my husband and I were talking because he would been he had been playing worship in the services and occasionally helping in the church food pantry. So uh, when we came back from vacation, he didn't go back to church right away. He... Uh, he wasn't on the roster to play uh, his guitar. They claim there were so many people up on stage he couldn't play. I mean, what? That doesn't even make sense to me either. But uh, then he was told that since he didn't go to church last weekend, that they want to make sure he doesn't go to church just to play worship. Anyways, the, my point is uh, the church as it is now is much more of a business and how things look. And we're going to actually, it kind of ties into Acts here. I'm on Revelation, which I'll tell you why in a minute. But that whole point of the business side of church ties in with the Acts study a little bit, and I literally just thought of that this moment. So, thank you, Yeah, He's still working. He's still moving. Despite the matrix, whether we're in a system, whether we're in a um, computer-generated, I mean on a large-scale computer like this, Earth is changed by the devil himself. So let's start there, and then we'll get into Acts. The reason I say the matrix... Um, not just because of mud flood events, not just because of timeline skewing, just because that's what it seems to be. Everything in our world is faked. And so why wouldn't even the even ground we walk on is fake? I've been reading also how everything is turning gray, and it's certainly true. I went outside yesterday the sky, and today it is the same, the sky is completely gray. I live in a suburb of Chicago, and they're doing construction on our street. There's gray dust everywhere. There wasn't even an ounce of enjoyment being outside this weekend. It actually brought me really down. Um, and things are becoming browner and grayer. Every day, I, um, you have to really search for the beauty. And I'm not saying that to be down. I'm just saying be aware. Um, and to me, the humidity brings me down. Um, it doesn't rejuvenate. I did read a post, you know, we need to ground ourselves and we need to um, have sunlight. And the more... They change the matrix around us the more we cannot do that. I would not go barefoot outside my door because there's construction dust and who knows broken glass all around and uh, whatever. <laughs> a bottle rockets from, from a couple weeks ago or last week and this week. I wouldn't be, I'd be injuring myself if I went out and tried to ground my body. And there is no sun so... We're not getting the, the vitamin D we need, and so anyways, I digress. But 
that's what this world is coming to. Um, and this is why I do believe right now we are in Revelation 20 somewhere. Uh, and then we'll compare it to Acts because I don't think Acts um, is seen the right way in the churches either. But one step at a time. So uh, Satan bound for a thousand years. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. A little while. <clears throat> okay, um, and as we know, uh, Revelation does not have to be read um, systematically, as in uh, the timeline, or see, seeing things in the order they're presented, okay, because you can see it right here. After these things, he'll be released for a little while. Uh, after the thousand years are finished. After what thousand years? Excuse me. The saints reign with Christ a thousand years. Okay. So it's saying he will be released before they start talking about, or John starts talking about the thousand year reign of Christ. Okay. So they give you that preview. They give you the content of the thousand years. Um, and then they give this part, which is where we are now, I believe. I do have to look. Yeah, no, I do believe this. Okay, verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations, which are the in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So basically, verse 8, 7b and 8 is where we are. And I say that because there's a lot of deception. And I do believe he deceives on every level of the senses. Uh, if we can't see past the grayness outside, um, then we are trapped. And he's out of prison, but he's put us in a prison until uh, the great white throne judgment and until he's thrown into the lake of fire so okay um let's go back to acts and we'll start i do have my mainstream commentary uh from college and I have to say, I have no idea, and maybe I said this in the previous videos, why I took this class in college. I didn't really want to. I actually was bored with it. I don't mean to be um, irreverent. It was just, I guess I just didn't understand it. Um, and I still really don't. But I do have a lot of questions in this commentary that I will comment on, okay? So let's read, and then I'll do the commentary. This is, it's called, if you'd like to look it up, Witness to Christ, a commentary on Acts by Stuart Custer. Acts 5, lying to the Holy Spirit. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part?
part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to Yah. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord, or of Yah? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. So a little bit of my own commentary that I had researched about this. Um, the basic premise of this was they wanted to give to the set-apart ones, Ecclesion, to give to those in need. And they were acting as though they had given all when they had only given part. And where I had read, it said they were not obligated to give anything. They could have sold or kept this possession of theirs um, and done whatever they wanted to with it. But because they wanted the accolades of being spiritual, uh, that's what made it wrong, obviously. So having an appearance of godliness. Okay. Um, seeming godliness and spirituality, but lied about it. So, um, another part I had read was these words, breathed her last, are only used for her and her husband, Ananias and Sapphira. And the same wording is for the terms where, um, Agrippa had been killed. So, Think of it as their breath was taken out of them by Yah instead of um, the, the person that I read said in comparison to Yahusha giving his spirit up so willingly. And these people who had straightforwardly went against Yah um, and rebelled, the breath was taken out of them by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So a couple things in this commentary by Custer are interesting to me. Um, he says that no one knew how to contact Sapphira. And I really am trying, this might be trite to you, but stick with me. I'm really trying to envision how the world and how the cities looked at this time because they did not look like dusty roads as in quote unquote Bible times as we were taught as children and even as adults. Um, so if they did not know how to contact her, um, I'm trying to think in technical technology terms. They couldn't contact her. Maybe they didn't know where she went. I don't think, you know, they didn't have, who knows what kind of technology they had to get a hold of each other and things like that. So that's just a side note. Um, so that is why uh, they had died. Like I said, they went against, they seemingly were spiritual, but held back selfishly uh, what they wanted. Um, in this, uh, commentary, it quotes Psalm 73, 9, 11, and 18. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. And they say, How doth Yah know, and their knowledge in the Most High? Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou cast them down into destruction. 
So it says, um, another commentator emphasizes that it was not fear of the apostles, but of the spirit before whom the lies found in every heart are open to view and who is able to smite the sinner in the very midst of his sin. Ananias and Sapphira had committed possibly the unpardonable sin, or close to the unpardonable sin, others say. Um, Cole Hill provides a list of Old Testament miracles of divine judgment and notes that today's churches would be much emptier if such standards were consistently applied. The occurrence of the word ecclesia is its first occurrence in the original text of Acts. The early church, Ecclesia, was wholly devoted to God, holy, H-O-L-Y, and disciplined by God. The church of today is certainly less holy. So uh, here's what I will get into also in the coming verses, uh, that the church is a business, and I didn't realize my my intro about how I feel about the church proper today would lead into this, but that's good. That means uh, maybe I think the Holy Spirit is teaching us something. Um, these apostles, Peter and the rest, were examples. And it says, like it said, when if these standards were consistently applied, um, the church would be much emptier. Uh, I believe that's because the church more recently has not been um, in uh, letting the Holy Spirit control what is going on. And we see that obviously with the big mainstream churches, those are Satan's churches. Um, but in personal churches you and I might know of, um, I would beg to differ that it's not Holy Spirit-led. It's more uh, business-led or um, what's popular, the culture, culturally-led. I know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sounding pretty judgmental, but that's really what I'm seeing. Um and I see these apostles, and we'll get to deacons and elders later, that these people were not as pastors and deacons that I have been uh, um, around. Maybe you also. Um, deacons in Acts and the, the leaders in Acts were completely different people than are today in the set-apart uh, groups of worshipers and believers. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Uh, in this commentary, I wrote or I underlined the apostles remained the unquestioned leaders of the church, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were being done among the people. The supernatural power of Yah, Yahusha, rested upon his chosen servants. They had no power of their own. His power worked through them. There follows a brief summary of the church's ministry and outreach, and they were all with one passion in the colonnade of Solomon. They were a fervent group meeting in a regular location for worship and testimony. Okay. All through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to Yah, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing might fall on them. Also, a multitude gathered from surrounding cities to Jerusalem, Jerusalem bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were healed. I don't see pastors as these apostles, these um, devout, spirit-led men of God, I do see pastors um, following what the dictates of the government did or are doing now. That's why 501c3 is so hard to be a part of. You're a part of an entity, uh, a business, 
deal between the government and a group of leaders. Okay. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and they laid their hands on the apostles, put them in the common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all of the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called counsel together with the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we have found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priests heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them with, without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set before them the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you to not teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Now, let's pause because this is what I am studying and understanding. The apostles were not, this is what they were angry at, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the high priests, the council. They were upset that their control of the Torah and their added teachings to the Torah, which is corruption. Let me get my thoughts together. Were being um, dismantled. So this is the part that I understand now where uh, the law is a covenant, an everlasting covenant and law. Moses's law that was given to him about the feasts and Yah's calendar and things like that. Okay, these Sadducees and Pharisees, the leaders of the temple, had added corruption to Yah's intended law. So it's not that the apostles were preaching against the law, they were preaching salvation through Yahusha and then saying how these councils and Pharisees had come against Yahusha when he was on earth and killed him. But it never says anything about Yahusha or the apostles completely taking out the law. What it says was they were preaching and teaching against just as Yahusha did, against the corruption of the law. Okay, verse 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God, Yah, rather than men. The Yah of our fathers raised up Yahusha, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him, God, Yah has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom Yah has given to those who obey him. Okay. Let me turn off my Bluetooth. I'm sorry, it keeps beeping at me. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my commentary. This is the other thing I've been studying. We are grafted in. We are the chosen ones. And we see that later in Acts anyway. So. Okay, Angel of Yah. Brought them out of prison. 
Um, we're not going to get into uh, the whole debate about Jesus' name, Yahusha. Uh, they did mention the atmosphere of fear. Plain that the people regarded the apostles as benefactors. The imperfect tense in were fearing implies a continuing atmosphere of fear. And when they brought them, they stood them before the Sanhedrin. Since the apostles had deliberately disobeyed the orders of the council, the council had formal charges to bring this time. The high priest begins the interrogation. Um, and they knew that they were being pointed at as the guilty ones of the Sanhedrin, and so forth. Um, Yahusha is the Savior, the author of life, and the author and the finisher of our faith. This is one of the exalted titles of Yahusha as the originator of life, salvation, and faith. There is an implied contrast. Yahusha is giving repentance, but the Sanhedrin is refusing to repent. He is giving forgiveness of sins, but the Sanhedrin is refusing to ask for it. Um, and now we'll get into Gamaliel. And I don't know if it was just my misunderstanding when I was young and in college that I saw Gamaliel as a negative person, but I couldn't really find that. I actually um, found quite the opposite. He was very uh, well-learned. He knew the scripture, he knew the law, and he was a very good teacher. And he was a well-respected man in the community. Some believe um, he was led by the Holy Spirit to stand up for Peter and the apostles. Other think he was just doing it for political, um, not gain, political um, balance for his um position uh, within this authority of the council. So I just I just wonder who Gamaliel really was um, because I read a few commentaries about him, but nothing um, too significant. It's just interesting how well known of a person he was and how highly thought of he was. And he did know these men were of the one true Yah the Most High, he did say that. So let's read that, verse 33. Gamaliel's advice. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. He said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Judas rose up, claiming to be somebody. This is very vague, by the way. I don't even know what that means. I don't even remember this part of scripture. I must have been tired that day in class. <laughs> A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain and all obeyed him, were scattered, came to nothing. After this, uh, a man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census, drew away many. After him, he also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against Yah. So he recognized the difference, obviously. And the whole reason the Sanhedrin was upset with them was because they thought they would have an uprising. Now, this was a different kind of uprising um, in the spiritual sense. And I just can't imagine these... Now, this is where the timeline gets a little interesting. These times right after... Yahusha had risen and gone into heaven in his ascension. These times were so tumultuous. We think we have tumultuous times. Um, and maybe they're coming. I'm not dismissing that. But I've always been hearing a lot about, in the church again, and this is what bothers me, and I, I'm trying to figure it out, we're always, we'll get ready for persecution. 
well, with this, you know what, hitting, uh, well, everyone's going to get the, the thing and they're going to coerce you to get the thing and that still hasn't happened and maybe I'm just being naive, but we are pretty safe. We can still street preach. I have friends who do that. We still can talk freely. We can go where we want uh, without, we can draw a crowd and in peace and not think we're going to be uh, killed. <laughs> um, so uh, this time was very, very tumultuous. And it just makes me think about the tribulation. Now, at the same time, there were many um, healings and miracles, visions. And it's not just because the Bible wasn't finished yet. You know, let's get, let's get off that soapbox because that doesn't mean a thing. Like I said in the beginning when I first started this study, where has the true power of the Holy Spirit gone? It's not because he's not there. Something has been blocking the spiritual influence. Again, Revelation 20, deception, matrix, um, our frequencies, I think it all has a connection um, of why we don't see these miracles happening anymore. And so I think it's good we... Um, apply this to our own hearts, but also our own understanding of what's really going on either with us or uh, in the world in general. So anyways, back to Gamaliel. Um, he did understand this was the most high, the true, yeah, working. Verse 40, and they agreed with him, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Yahusha and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Yahusha as the uh, Messiah. Okay, now chapter 6. Now in those days, when the number of disciples were multiplying, there arose a compliant, I'm sorry, a complaint <laughs> against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of Yah and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Philip Procurus Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, and a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and they had prayed, laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Okay, there's another point. The priests were obedient to the faith. They did not stop practicing the law. They were obedient to following Yahusha, believing in his salvation. Okay, my one main point for this is, uh, especially in the Baptist churches, they speak highly and a lot about the deacons. Uh, and of course, Paul has some writings about deacons and bishops and all that stuff, which I kind of question because, like I said, these men that I've seen for years uh, since I've grown up in church, are not these type of men. I'm not judging them. I can't judge them. Some I can. Some I can't. Um, uh, I've seen deacons who were complete uh, adulterous men, and the pastor had stood up for them. 
I have seen pastors become power hungry in the past. I have seen pastors become callous to others' needs. I have seen deacons um, side with the pastor or side with the people, which causes division. I have seen deacons um, and elders come together who are struggling, and we all struggle, I'm not saying that, but completely do not live any example of the Holy Spirit working in them at all. And some of these are my personal friends' husbands who I know their struggles, and they are completely not as these men in Acts were, but are yet deacons because they have knowledge about money or they have knowledge about you know, I don't even know some of them. Like, why are you even asking them to be a deacon? Um, anyways, uh, <laughs> I think that, to me, we should not always model the church's deacons from these contexts, because this context was because certain widows needed help and uh, there was just the delegation of you take care of these widows so that they're not missed anymore but I, I dare anybody and just comment if I'm wrong I do not ever I have never seen I mean I'm only 39 I have never seen a deacon in any churches I have ever attended, and I've attended multiple denominations. Um, I've been in a, I grew up in the Pentecostal Church, Assembly of God, um, non-denominational, Baptist. Um, I, my parents grew up Catholic, so I was in the Catholic Church till I was two, and I heard what my mom had seen and heard in those churches. None of those deacons were full of faith and power and did great wonders and signs among the people. And we all know about Stephen being the first martyr. And I think it's wrong to appoint deacons in the church for any um, leadership aspect except to be servants because I have not seen deacons in my whole life be servants as these men were servants. That's why I have a problem with the church now as a whole. I don't see this. So we know Stephen's um, great example of faithfulness and holiness. So it says, Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Syria. Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. Verse 10, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Yeah, okay, he wasn't speaking. Again, here's another point about the law. He was not speaking anything against the law. And they stirred up the people, the elders, the scribes, they came upon him, seized him, brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words. Speak words. Okay, let's exclude that. Not cease to speak words against this holy place in the law. For we have heard him say that Yahushua of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looked steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Okay. So here's, so that was my commentary on deacons. Um, this mainstream commentary uh, talks about the office of deacons. Like I said, serving. Um... I think he mistakes mistakes the office of deacon or the position of deacon wrongly. They want them to rule well and be overseers. Um, yes and no. I don't think they should rule anything. That's not what the purpose of the set apart ecclesion ecclesia was. 
Um, so I just, I just highly disagree with <laughs> today's church business. Okay. Um, so here's a little bit about Stephen. One of the deacons, Stephen, comes forward and brings the witness in Jerusalem to a climax. His powerful ministry moves the gospel out beyond Jerusalem and sets the stage for the witness of Philip and Paul, who will follow. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was perf performing great wonders and signs among the people. His name, Stephen, means crown, and in the, this case, anticipates his triumphal testimony and the martyr's crown that awaited him. Stephen was chosen as a deacon because he was already, already full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Now he is endowed with faith and power to work miraculous wonders and signs among them. Among them, Stephen is the first person besides the apostles known to have such miraculous powers. He plainly takes his witness to the Hellenistic synagogues in Jerusalem with great impact. But now bitter resistance arises. Um, the freedmen were former slaves who had been manum manumitted, set free. Then, as now refugees and immigrants tended to cluster together with others of similar social and ethnic back background, they were vehemently arguing against Stephen's presentation of Yahusha as the prophesied Messiah, and they were not strong enough to resist the wisdom of the spirit by which he was speaking. Yahusha had promised to so empower his servants, his servants, excuse me, for I will be, I will give you a mouth. And wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. That's Luke twenty one fifteen. Stephen explained the Messianic scriptures in a way that they could not disprove. Then they procured men to commit perjury, who said, "We have heard him speaking the blasphemous words against Moses and Yah." In the legal sense, to suborn witnesses is to procure men to tell a lie under oath. They do not present facts. They accuse Stephen and appeal to the prejudices of the people. Um, now, I would say we should be put in the same context as what I'm going to, going to read now. To observant followers of Yahusha, in the book it says observant Jews, but I am doing as I have been trying to learn. To observant Yahusha followers, to harm the temple with sacrilege, to change Moses' tradition was unthinkable. I do believe still we should get back to the eternal law that Yah has sent from the, set, set up from the beginning. Okay. So. Um, this is just before Stephen's last sermon, obviously, before he dies. <sighs> I think that's all I have to say. I'm sorry I went on a little bit. I don't want to sound of like I went on a bitter trail. Um, I'm just seeing things clearer. At the same time, it's harder because no one... I don't think that I know in the church will understand, and that's okay. I really don't care anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, whatever the Spirit leads to do, that's what we need to do. So uh, in this timeline with Acts, I'm still on the fence. I do believe it could have been right before um, the tribulation occurred. There was much more tumult, tumult, sorry, tumult in these times than uh, we have right now. And I think it's because we are shackled in this matrix. But I will stop it there. I will not go on my own anymore. But I pray we will have more understanding. I pray the Holy Spirit will speak to you to make things clear to you, and I will see you for the next video. Blessings.